So um, welcome everyone. This is the second R workshop uh, with Scott McKeon, a data science at Chevron, among other things. Um, so yeah, he'll be taking you through R and some of uh, the data forecasting uh, work that he's been putting together. So Scott. Hey, thanks Remy. Okay, so today we're gonna pick up where we left off from the last session. Last session, we talked a lot more about like the fundamentals of R, I introduced the idea of this like tidy verse universe for data munging. I introduced ggplot. And now I wanted to get kind of into the nuts and bolts of the actual kind of like an example of what we might look at in the competition. And I wanted to cover a couple concepts that we might want to think about with forecasting. This is going to get pretty heavy if you start diving into the details, but I wanted to give you an overview of how I would potentially start considering a time series problem. So I'm gonna, oh, Remy, could you enable participant screen sharing, please? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, you're good. Okay, perfect. Just gonna share my, uh, just share my R Studio screen. Can you see that, Remy? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so today we're gonna go through this idea of forecasting. Now. Remember last session, we went into this whole idea of data munging. So we talked about loading your data, cleaning it up, parsing it out, merging, and a couple of simple plots that you could do in ggplot to visualize some things. So you can go back at the last session and look at that. Today, I'm gonna to take you on an absolute whirlwind tour of time series forecasting and kind of how to deal with time series in R. And this is where I think either using Python or R is really gonna help in doing this hackathon that you guys are doing because it is really tough to do time series in something like Excel and just visualizing it, it really kind of lacks some of the um, predictive power. So to get started, we have a couple extra libraries we're gonna load in. So these are kind of your uh, tidyverse packages. And then I'm gonna load in two packages that specifically deal with time series. So um, you can see up in this RStudio thing that it already detected that we're in, there's some packages that we're using that we aren't installed. So I'm gonna hit that. And alternatively, you could just type in install packages forecast. And what you can see going on on my screen is that I'm installing one of the packages. I kind of wanted to leave this so you could see kind of how package install works. So uh, the forecast package is put out by the Robert Heinemann's group. And in the previous lecture, I think I provided a little bit of information about uh, time series forecasting, but there's two references down at the bottom of this R Markdown document that you guys probably want to take a look at. First is time series de decomposition. So there's this little PDF that someone put together that I thought was actually pretty good about dealing with R in time series. And then this book, um, I was just gonna click on that and open it up. This book is amazing. It's really heavy. And so for a hackathon, there's gonna be, there's a lot to learn. But if you're wondering about kind of how to do time series forecasting. This book is put up for free online and it talks a lot about judgmental forecasts, um, time series regression and our REMA models, which I'm gonna to cover today. And then the authors of this book put out the forecasting package. So it actually looks pretty good. So say if I were to click on an ARIMA modeling in R, they have this thing called auto ARIMA in the forecast package that you can use and it takes away a lot of the complexity to doing a RIM modeling. So you can go in here and say, okay, I want to put this through the pipe. So they use a tidyverse philosophy, which is why I was kind of covering that. And then I want to do some dis displays and then I want to build a model. And it's actually the amount of code that you can use to do, do something really, really complex, including fitting this ARIMA model. Let's minimize that. Um, Oh, and sorry, you guys can't actually see that. So, oh, yeah. okay, rewind. Sorry, Remy. Let, let me know yeah. if I uh, if I mess up. Okay, yeah. so I, I clicked on that link, forecasting principles and practices, and I was showing this ARIMA models, ARIMA modeling in R, and so 
this forecasting package has something called Auto Arima, and you can see that the book covers how to use it, talking about um, some time series concepts. This is an auto regression plot. I'll talk about that a little bit today. Up to all the way to building an auto Arima model and, and plotting it. So I think unless you're wanting to dive into some really complex data science topics around time series forecasting, this will allow you to do something really dangerous and really interesting very quickly. And it's why like, this is one of the reasons why I love R is that there's packages like this that make it really fascinating to do some really interesting work. So check it out. Uh, we're gonna go through this workflow in this session today. And I just wanted to, let's dive into it. So you can see my R screen right now, Remy? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, so going back to what we were talking about, we loaded this forecasting package. So in the first chunk, I'm gonna load all the libraries. Make sure you can get all these loaded. And you'll see that a couple things in R packages have these functions and R is a very functional language and they can tend to mask it's each other. So you can see that these like objects and um, functions are masked. So it's just worth paying attention to. You wanna make sure that you're calling the right function. Now, I covered loading data in the previous session. So here, what we're gonna do is just take the reader package, read the CSVs, and then I'm gonna use this janitor package to clean the names of the CSVs. And I'll show you what that does. So if, um, if I copy this and I just call this energy raw. So I'm going to load three things. I'm going to load an energy raw, an energy, and a weather. And I'm going to use this janitor clean names to clean it up. So we load it up. Now, if I take a look at this energy raw, you can see that there's spaces, these slashes and everything in the column names. And you can also type in call names. So you can see that there's spaces and these slashes are gonna really mess us up when we're trying to call columns in an effective way. But by calling this clean names in the janitor package, you can see that it's taken out that slash, it's taken out all the spaces automatically. And it gives you this nice clean formatted column name that you can call using the basic R package. So I'd recommend doing that. Okay, uh, I went over this a lot yesterday, but I wanted to show you why the grammar of data stuff is so important. So when we're thinking about time series, what you might wanna do is say, okay, well, does the day of the week depend on like, if it's a Saturday or Sunday, is that a lot different than Monday through Friday? What year is it? What month, what week? And that's a really nice way if you're not gonna be looking at it as an entire time series to kind of disaggregate the data. Well, if you use functions from the Luberdate package, so all of these are functions from the Luberdate package and you could call them explicitly using luberdate.date. Um, but you can actually use this mutate to take energy. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna clean this up. So you, I'm gonna clear my environment, rerun this, rerun this. And then, then I'm gonna open up energy. So you can see all the columns here and they stop at price actual. I'm gonna run this and just watch how that gets updated. So now, I have numeric values for the year, the month, the week, the day, the day of the week, and just the date itself. And why this will be really important is that now I can actually group time series by year. So if I say I wanted to do a box plot of total load versus year, I can actually do that. And I can say, okay, well, here's the first year, second, third, fourth. So there's a trend, a yearly trend of the actual load increasing just a little bit, but it still is increasing. And if I wanted to say, get the yearly trend of time series with groups, I can then use this data, uh, this grammar of data to group by say the year and do a summary. So say if I wanted to say, okay, I wanna group by the day of the week in the year, which is this column here. And then I wanna summarize the mean of everything. 
I can really quickly do that because I've extracted that day of the week. So now I've taken this 35,000 row data frame and I've grouped it by year and day. And I've given a summary or a mean of what each one is. So you can start to do some interesting things with that on time series. So you can say like, okay, what's the mean difference between Saturday and Friday? What's the mean, like the mean of Saturday and Sunday versus the weekdays? And this, when you're dealing with energy is a really big deal. So when you talk about industrial and uh, the working week versus the weekends, it's a pretty big difference. And then you can also start to do these groups. So when we look in ggplot, you can go and take something like energy and you can group total load actual by month. And so then what it's done is it's taken the years and you can snap, start to see the monthly fluctuations. And you could easily uh, change that into day of the week. Do that. So you can see that on Monday it grows and then down. So it's down on the weekends. Looks like Saturday, you've got a bit more and then going from there. So that's uh, one way that you can start to deal with time series is by taking out these columns as features and then doing some aggregation or disaggregation on that. So, but when we're talking about forecasting, forecasting can be really, really hard. And a lot of times if you're trying to forecast time series and say you're trying to forecast a random walk and a lot of stocks, they said uh, stock market fluctuations can be attributed as random walks. The best forecast that you can do for that is to take the average and maybe the trend and use that to make your forecast. So you take the last, the last day and you take whatever that was plus the trend and use that as your forecast. And that might give you the best estimate in a highly random noisy system. Now, when we talk about electricity, there's obviously some things that are driving that. The weather is going to drive it. The, uh, the economy, there's a whole bunch of things that should drive what we're doing when we're forecasting something like energy versus weather, right? Now, to do that, you wanna maybe decompose it. And so you can start to look at say the daily demand. But one of the problems with that, so if we take this, you can have this aggregated up by date but that's not really a time series anymore. So now we just have this column where it's, which is date. So we've grouped by date. And I remember way up here, I made that date column by using, taking the date. Cause when you actually load this in, it's gonna be a time stamp. So pay attention uh, and pay really careful attention to how the dates are loaded. So you can group by date and then you can take the mean by taking the average of all the electricity demand and then remember back to yesterday, we talked about selecting. So you can select this date and the total load actual, but it's not a time series. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this function from the zoo package. Now remember we loaded two packages in the zoo and the forecasting package. And I'm gonna read in this data frame and turn it into a time series. And if I look at this, now it's got some additional info. So sorry, I might, uh, I might stop that. It seems like it's loading everything, but let's just pause that. So now it's loaded in. It says, okay, here's the start and end and the frequency. So it's a daily time series and you can see the total load actual. Now what you'll notice right off the bat is that there's some NAs here. And if you're doing any type of numeric modeling, that's probably gonna mess you up a little bit. And maybe that's because there is one recording in that day that didn't work. So you probably want to deal with that, right? So in here, what we can do is, I also noticed that when I was looking at the data, there is one observation in 2014. So uh, December 12th, uh, December 2000, or sorry, 2014, December 31st. And that really messes up some of your summary stats if you're trying to aggregate by a uh, year or month or day. So I filter that out group by, and then notice the difference here. I'm using this summarize, which is another tidyverse aggregation verb, but I'm putting this na remove is equal to true. And then I'm specifying this a little bit of a different way. So in here, I can take the daily demand, load that in, 
and you'll see I dropped one number and now it starts at 2015. And then I'm going to declare it as a time series by just passing in the column and when it starts. So the frequency is 365.25 days. And I can then read that in. And you'll see that it's very similar. So they're both time series, but this one now has the years encoded properly. And if I pull this out, you can see that it's very similar, but now it has the start and end, the frequency, and there's no NAs. So just a, a couple hints with trying to like load in time series data and if you're playing with it. Um, Remy, did you have any questions or did anyone have any questions on that? Yeah, no, none for me. It's just uh, handling the NAs is pretty important. Yeah, like you said. Hmm. Yeah, so as long as you have a really good handle and you, if you're gonna be doing any of this forecasting stuff that we're gonna talk about, you need to have a time series. And this is where it becomes pretty interesting. So I'm gonna use this function from the forecasting package called auto plot. And I wanna show you that when you have a time series, some of the interesting things you can do about it. So now you can start to encode these as automatic time series. And there's some really interesting stuff that we're gonna do after that. But um, ggplot and this forecasting package deal with time series objects. So you wanna make sure that when you load in your data that you have a time series bit of data. Okay, so let's just briefly talk about time series forecasting. And I want to run you through the idea of de decomposition of time series and what they call an ARIMA model. These are generally full um, graduate level courses in time series forecasting. If you're in economics or something, this would be one or two courses on its own. And I'm gonna run it through it in probably the next 15 minutes. Yeah, 15 or so minutes. So hold on, but take a look at these two references. First one, this is, um, I thought a really nice little PDF about a little book for time series by Avril Colvin. And I thought it was actually pretty good. They, she talks a lot about, you know, getting started with R and then using R for time series, including decomposition, forecasting, ARIMA models. And it's quite short. So if you wanted to start there, that's kind of the too long, didn't read version. And then like I talked about the full blown, if you really want to get into to forecasting, uh, this, is, this is the book you should read. I think it's really great. So take a look at those. Now, when we talk about time series, generally time series is a combination of multiple different trends, okay? And when we talk about forecasting, we talk a lot about decomposing those trends into the data, an overall trend, whether that be monthly, yearly, daily, a seasonal component that varies up and down, and then the remainder. And so if you, if you think that you can be very successful in time series forecasting, you should be able to understand how to disaggregate the data. So you can see in here, what we're doing is we're calling this STL function from the forecast package. And then we're calling a time window. So this time window is, says, okay, take 13 months, which is um, if you look at the documentation, that's kind of what you wanna do for annual. We could change it to 12 too. And so you set a period and maybe we wanna change it to, um, if we have daily values, 365. And now you can start to see like, okay, here's our annual trend. So down on the first year, back up, and here's your decomposition and then your remainder. So you can start to play with this and say, okay, well, if I think that we are quarterly, so if we have a time window of four, how does that look? So that's every four days. If you're trying to divide it into months, maybe that's every 30 days. These are monthly. If we're gonna do an annual time window, that's 365, you can do that. 
and you can start to see a little bit of how we're going to try to disaggregate this into trends and seasonal. And so stepping back for a moment, like why would we want to do this? Well, if we just plot this data, so if we go up and look at this, you can see that we have a seasonal trend. And in some of the stuff that we did earlier, we showed that we know there's an upward trend with time. We know that monthly the, the data fluctuates and we know that daily the data fluctuates. So if you start taking some of these verbs that we did way up up here and looking at how data fluctuates with time, ARIMA models or, for, or time series forecasting allows you to actually pull that out. And it allows you to actually set different components to your model and go through how you're going to do the forecasting. So what this does is it fits a trend and sets that. It provides a seasonal component. And then the remainder is what you're really interested in. So it takes this out and says, OK, I know that there's going to be this much trend. I know there's going to be this much seasonal component. That's fine. We can forecast that knowing how it's going to work, that it's going to continue to increase and that we expect that there's going to be a seasonal component, but this is what we'd consider this random noise. And that's probably what's going to differentiate your approach. So like, what is driving that random noise? We see that there's clearly a bit of trend left in this remainder. It doesn't look like it's pure white noise. So what's actually driving that? And how does that disaggregate with some of these components? Like if you have all of these generation components and you have all this weather information, that's none of that's considered in this time series. So the big question becomes, how are we gonna encode some of that information in trying to forecast this? And that's kind of the big challenge with time series forecasting. Now, this is uh, seven lines of code that I'm gonna take about 10 minutes to explain. And I'm gonna use George's book to talk about it. So when we talk about time series decomposition, you can look at chapter six and take a look at this time series forecasting that we talk about. So this, the trend, the seasonality, this, I talked about all of that. Now, one of the most important things to understand about time series is that they're what you call auto regressive, which means that if the day yesterday was 20 degrees, the chance of the day today being minus 20 or zero is quite low. So if you wanted to make a prediction on a time series, it's not as simple as saying, okay, well, here's all these variables. I think these variables mean this is going to happen. You also need to consider the past series from the time. So autoregressive means, okay, well, how many periods are driving that change, right? Um, you can see I use this STL decomposition that you can take a look at. And then in chapter eight, they talk about ARIMA models. Now, ARIMA stands for auto regressive. Um, and then I think the I stands for, um, I think seasonal, and then MA stands for moving average. So it's basically like an auto regressive moving average. And so basically what it's doing is it's taking into account all of the past data to make a prediction. And so if I scroll down here, and say if I go into ARIMA modeling at R and take a look at that, it talks about sort of the differences and then this auto ARIMA package. But what it does, and you can take a look at the modeling procedure as well, it takes your, your time series, it breaks it down. Now, these two things are called the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function. And what this is doing is it's taking the time series and it's taking a diff of it. So it's saying, okay, well, what's the difference between yesterday and today? And it starts to look a lot more like a random series. So you can see that that's the diff. And then this autocorrelation function says, hey, at a certain leg, and this is in, um, I believe, months, how, how many months can we expect to know something about the data? And this blue line kind of encodes your assumption for white noise. And anything outside of that says, okay, well, at a leg of one or three months, I'm starting to see a lot of correlation in this differential time series. So when we talked about breaking that down, that little, that last little bar at the bottom said um, basically that you can use that to make some predictions.
this ARIMA model starts to encode that. So it encodes the seasonality, encodes the trend, and then it encodes this autocorrelation, and it uses all of that to make a model. How it does that is way too complex to cover in the next couple of minutes, but it's really worth taking a look at if you're going to be doing time series forecasting. It is kind of the de facto way beyond using deep learning or machine learning methods to do time series forecasting. And often it's quite hard to beat, even if you were to use pretty advanced machine learning methods. Um, generally, you'd start and your first assumption would be like, okay, well, I think yesterday or tomorrow is going to be equal to yesterday. And that's a really good assumption. And then you might want to say, well, actually, the temperature has been increasing for the past week. So maybe we take yesterday or today is equal to yesterday plus this certain trend. That's your second order model. And you can say, okay, well, actually, there's a seasonality component. And maybe we should take that seasonality into account and say, okay, well, there's a trend this week, but over the months, we're actually on the downtrend for seasonality. So let's take that into account too. And so you can see how this ARIMA model starts building up and making a forecast. The beautiful thing about using R is that it has these functions really built in. So you don't need to worry about the math and it does this automatically. And there's actually a, a function called auto plot and forecast and fit. So you can fit a model and then plot the forecasts to see how it looks. So Basically, everything is baked in using the forecasting package. And you can use this auto ARIMA model to try to get what I think is a pretty good forecast of electricity demand. And then you can start to build it up. So if you wanted to move further than that, you can maybe look at some sort of machine learning or something a bit more complex, or maybe adjusting this model based on what other variables you might want to look at. And you could do that manually. You don't need to build some complex machine learning model. You could just say, hey, this forecast said that it was this, but it's actually this. And I think that difference is driven by weather. I think that difference is driven by X, Y, or Z. And you can start to develop a story around how you're doing that work. So back to R, we talked about this. Doing this ARIMA is really easy. In the forecasting package, it's almost shockingly easy. So there's three functions that you really need to, to work on. The first is this auto ARIMA, okay? So I'm gonna run that. And you can see it's churning through everything and it'll churn through that time series. Takes a, takes a minute or two. And so what it's doing is it's checking all the possible combinations of these ARIMA models. It's checking the seasonality, it's checking the trend, and it takes about one minute and it'll give you a statistically valid, um, I guess, cost function minimized ARIMA model. So this, uh, how you can read this is that it says that there's a lag of about five days and order one um, with a seasonal model. So that you can look into what these coefficients mean, but it says, this is the best model there, sorry, fifth order with a leg of one seasonality of two or something. This is the best model that I think fits the data. And you can check it. So you can check this check residuals. And it'll give you how, much, how this looks, the autocorrelation. So you can see that like, if this is random noise, what we'd expect random noise to be, we still have a lot of work to do. So you can see that there's still a lot of stuff outside and that there's a lot of higher residuals that we want to capture. Ideally, this, if you had perfect white noise, it should follow this little Gaussian orange line. So that's what we talk about when we think about randomized, a random walk, it should fit within here. So we're clearly missing some stuff with this model, but it's a good start. And we can check to see what the forecast is on this just by running this auto plot forecast fit. And you'll notice that this is a really bad model because it's basically predicting the mean out to 2020 or whatever. And you can change, if you look into the API for this, you can change how far it's forecasting, but really you can see the uncertainty of this model exploding. And that's really important to communicate to say, okay, well, we've done all this work with ARIMA, but we don't have a good handle on the uncertainty. And so, we really don't know past a couple of days 
what we're trying to predict. And that's fine because the, I think the challenge it won't be trying to forecast electricity demand three years into the future. It'll probably be focusing on this little region here. And so you can do this with a couple different models. So if you look into that forecasting package, there's lots of really interesting things. You can run a forecast. And once again, we're gonna use pipes to do this. And by using this ETS model, which is, it's an ARIMA style model, but just a little bit different. You can see that we've really crunched our uncertainty already. So we have a, a really good prediction for a couple of days, and then you can start to, to work with that. Now, I know that was a really high level introduction to some really complex topics, but I hope that that'll help you start thinking about forecasting in your guys' competition. I'm gonna host some office hours to at least chat out the problem with everyone and see if I can lend a little bit of support. I think this is a really difficult problem and I think it'll be a nice challenge for everyone. But yeah, I, I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with and um, maybe trying to help you out in some of the thought process and trying to get to, to this to work in R or in Python if you guys need help there too. It's a little bit trickier doing this stuff in Python. I'll admit some of the ARIMA stuff in Python isn't necessarily as well developed as this. So if you wanted to go kind of the ARIMA route, R is I think what I'd recommend starting with. Um, did you have any questions? I know that was really high level, but Remy, do you think you have any questions for the, the group or anything? I have a question. Mm -hmm. How does the auto.arima function choose which one's the best model? Like, does it look at any criteria or does it like split up the data into in sample, out of sample? So it uses the Akiaki information or the Bayesian information criteria. And it's so that's in sample then, right? Yeah, it's in sample and yeah, and it minimizes the, the cost function. So I think actually it uses the log likelihood as well as this. So this is uh, the AIC and the BIC are complexity penalized values. So it's one thing to minimize the cost in sample, but you want to make sure you aren't overfitting. That's always whenever you're fitting a model, that's always the challenge is that you can fit it really well, but it won't generalize very well. And so I think what it does is it cross validates um, predictions. So it, I think it does split up the in sample um, validation metrics, it does a cross validation, but then it penalizes the complexity of the model. So what it'll probably do is it gives you, and I, I need to look exactly about how the auto arena package does it, but I'm pretty sure that it's minimizing the AIC or the Akiaki information criteria, which every time you add another order of complexity, it'll penalize the value. So it, it, auto, it really tries to keep a simpler model. Does that, uh, does that help answer your question? Uh, yep, thanks. Okay. And then um, this is all done automatically. Is there a way of tuning the models after? There is. So if you look into the forecasting book, they actually provide an ARIMA where you fit it. So this ARIMA model, you can set the order. And generally with ARIMA models, you only set the order of complexity, um, the autoregressive, so the autoregressive order, the seasonality and the trend, and then it'll automatically fit it. So it'll give you these coefficients on the model. So you can pick if you wanted a simpler or more complex model, you can say, okay, well, I want an autoregressive order of this. I want trend, I want seasonality. Um, so you can do that and then, then it'll still automatically fit it. And beyond that, you're probably into sort of building your own, your own model up. And I'd look, um, you can look at like the seasonal RIMA that, that might be called SARIMA, but you can take a look at that and see if there's like seasonality. So this book is really amazing. So I, I take a look at that. If you want, if you want to go down that uh, season or seasonality arima road, I take a look at that. And then if you wanted to talk about like a regression style model, there's also this idea of like regression time series forecasting. So you can take a look at that too. It gets pretty complicated though. So I'd, I'd recommend just starting really simple and then trying to think about, okay, well, we have these predictions from these well thought out robust statistical models. How are we gonna improve that? Mm -hmm. 
Great. Is there any other clarifications you think that the workshop people might might want, or we can always just pick it up in office hours? I know it's kind of just sort of dumped this idea of time series modeling, but it's a really complex subject, and I think there's there's a lot to think about and a lot to learn. So it's it'll be a good hackathon for everyone. Yeah, there's uh, there's definitely still a little bit of time. I think a lot of study is needed for understanding these models and understanding how everything goes together. Um, and then, yeah, as soon as the hackathon comes on the 14th and 15th, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, crunching everything together. So yeah, yeah, totally. I think that it, it's a lot of work, but there's there's a lot of like smart people. So if you get get into groups, I think there's some really interesting ideas that might come out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think the same thing as well. Um, Any other questions from the room? Yeah, one more thing. Um, would you recommend like trying every model there is? And then, okay, so you have like um, the exponential smoothing models and you have like naive models and then you have auto arima and then you have um, the regressive models, the regression models. Would you recommend like trying all of those out? And yeah, like, I think- Finding, I don't know, like the best fit in terms of like in sample, out of sample, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think so. I think if you, I think it's a really great idea. And then that's kind of like, if I was taking the data science approach, that's kind of what I would do. I would say like, okay, well, let's, let's look at this. If I, and then trying to like, yeah, you can game it by trying to fit, find the best time series model in here. So you could go through this book and say, okay, well, let's try this. And then Let's try this and try this. And the nice thing is your data set isn't enormous. So you can do that. It only takes a couple minutes to train an auto arima model. Same thing with like the time series de de decomposition. It'll give you a chance to like try some of these things, right? And then, but move quickly like with that experimentation into trying to understand the problem. And if you can spend your time trying to understand the problem and not getting hung up on, okay, how do I make an arima model? I think that's where you can really see some really nice benefits on something like a hackathon. So yeah, give it a try, throw the kitchen sink at it, and then really think about the problem and then tweak it from there. That's my recommendation. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Great. thank you, Scott, for all the information provided. It's super useful, I'm sure. And I'm sure during the hackathon events, people will be coming back and also to your office hours, um, which we're going to set up. So yeah, once again, just thank you for all the information. Thank you for all your time. Um, really grateful for these sessions and uh, really glad that you can make it as well. Yeah, and I, I hope that it's useful. So good luck with the, the hackathon and enjoy the conference, everyone. I'll probably chat with you in February. <laughs>